World War I was a profound influence. It affected millions of people around the world, including the soldiers on the front and also those back home. It affected many families with a lot of soldiers not returning home and the ones who did were forever changed. World War I would also have a profound influence on those who wrote about the war, whether that be as soldiers during it or afterwards in memoirs and in fiction. And today I want to explore some of those words written by those influenced by one of the biggest events of the 20th century. Hi, my name is Justin A.K. Ghost Reader, and today we're going to talk about literature and World War I. This is part of my Remembering the First World War series, and you can find links in the description box below to my other videos and also at the end of this video. So today I'm going to talk about a work of nonfiction, a work of fiction, and a collection of poems. All Quiet on the Western Front by Eric Maria Remark, Storm and Steel by Ernst Younger, and Poems by Wilfred Owen. So the first book I want to talk about was written by Eric Maria Remark. He was a soldier in the German army and joined in 1916. He was badly wounded in the war, but they survived till his end. He later published All Quiet on the Western Front in November and December of 1928 in a German newspaper and was published as a book in 1929. So All Quiet on the Western Front is a fictional account of Paul Balmer and his friend, group of friends of, who are German soldiers and their experiences on the Western Front. From fighting in the war, to dealing with life in the trenches, to seeing their wounded friends die around them, the experience of going back home. Eric Remark in this story tries to encapsulate the entire soldier experience in this book. And I think he does so quite well. What he does in this book is try to relay what war was really like for soldiers uh, on the front. The public had one perception of what war was like, and by the end, a lot of the perceptions that have been uh, present before the war have been broken. Before World War I, war was thought of in patriotic and nationalistic terms. Um, it was something that was good for the nation. Uh, you went off to do your patriotic duty, and you came back with glory, or at least that was the idea. However, the First World War, especially the war that happened on the Western Front, changed that entirely. And a lot of these soldiers coming back began to write about their experiences. You began to see that. Now, during the war, there was a lot of press censorship. So a lot of people still had that public that perception that the war was something glorious. However, as casualty lists were published and people began to see a lot of people dying, more men going off to war. And uh, it dragging on for four years, a lot of this began to change. And in the book, All Quiet on the Western Front, uh, Remark basically looks at the German soldier, he looks at a soldier, because even though he's German, you can kind of say this is probably the experience for most soldiers fighting on any of the fronts, whether it be the Western Front or uh, fronts in the Middle East, at Gallipoli, or in Africa. A lot of these youths went to war brimming with confidence. They went because they were asked to by their nations, it was expected of them, and they go to war a feeling that this is something that needed to be done, something good. And once they got into it with all the death and the dying around them, uh, they see that it's not all it was made to be. They are kind of disillusioned by this war. They see that they're fighting this and there seems to be no, not only no end in sight, but that they kind of been duped, at least that's the feeling they get. There's one of their schoolmasters told them all, you should go, you should do your patriotic duty, and yet he's not there. The guy who talked them into doing this great thing and instead all they found was horror on the battlefield. And I think the most poignant uh, part of All Quiet on the Western Front was when he goes home, when the main character goes home. When he goes home, he finds that everything's different. Uh, he no longer fits back into civilian life. I mean, there are people going about their daily lives. Um, his father is asking stupid questions, or questions that he feels are worthless. And he's completely different. He no longer fits in the society that he left. And how does he fit in when the war is eventually over? Um, and this was a question a lot of soldiers had to deal with coming back. I mean, and, and even today, soldiers deal with this, trying to reintegrate back into society. Because you've been forever changed. You've killed people. You've seen things that most people hopefully will never see in their lifetimes. And now you come back to civ civilian life and things don't seem the same anymore. Things that used to excite you are no longer important to you anymore. Civilian life pales in comparison to what you went through before and he feels alien in his own town reading that was quite an experience because remark did a really good job portraying this alienation of a soldier coming back for home leave uh from the war and i can see why all quiet on the western front is considered one of the greatest uh novels uh, concerning world war one 
The next book I want to talk about is uh, Storm of Steel by Ernst Younger. Ernst Younger was also a soldier in the German army and he uh, published this as his memoirs. It's actually part of his diary entries that he adapted uh, into this book and um, it's basically a recounting of what he did during the war. He served in the war from 1915 to 1918 and he himself was wounded 14 times. And this was published in 1920, uh, making it one of the first memoirs to be published about the war. Now, Summer Still is different than All Quiet on the Western Front. While All Quiet on the Western Front seeks to confront the horrors of war to kind of show you that war probably wasn't worth it at all for a lot of these soldiers and the, the damage that it did to them, in this book, Ernest Younger talks about the war. He doesn't seek to make it uh, anything other than a war that he went and fought in, and here is what I did. He doesn't try to make the reader see how bad war was. In fact, you kind of get the idea from him that war wasn't that bad at all. I mean, it did have his ups and downs. I and mean, he was wounded 14 times throughout this book, actually shot in the chest once. But uh, while the war had its challenges, it wasn't something that was um, completely useless or anything like that. What you get from this is a war account that isn't trying to make the war seem bad, but just tell you about the general challenges that he faced as a soldier in his life. So he's not trying to uh, say that the, you know, the war is bad, this is something that we shouldn't have did. For Ernest Younger, it, it feels like this is something that I came to do, and I came and I did my job. And during the war, he uh, did a lot of different things. He was present at a lot of different battles. He's present at the Somme, at Cambrai, and also at the last German offensive in the spring of 1918. And he talks about um, soldier life, all aspects of it, uh, living in the trenches, fighting uh, rats and, li and lice, um, his own experiences and lo losing some of uh, his friends that were with him uh, in, in war. And he also describes uh, him meeting a, and coming into contact with an Indian regiment of British soldiers who um, they at first when the Germans heard them they had no idea who was um, out there because they heard a language they didn't understand and come to find out it was actually Indian soldiers and that was quite an interesting experience um, that he had there. Um, also he went on a couple night patrols which were quite make for quite exciting re uh, reading and um, it was this one time where he, he like falls into a foxhole he doesn't know which way to go. He doesn't know if he goes forward, if he's going to end up in his own trenches, or if he goes back, he's going to end up back in enemy trenches. And then there's also a kind of moving scene where he comes across um, a soldier who is, I forget if he's British or French, but he comes across a soldier and he has his gun pointed at him. And the soldier takes out a picture of like his wife and kids and kind of shows it to him. And Ernest Younger lets him go. And he, Ernest Younger doesn't know if the guy made it back home, but he hopes and he thinks that because he let him go that perhaps he did. From reading Storm and Steel, you get like this exciting, caring, and gripping account of what it was like to be a soldier in World War I. But what you don't get is someone looking at the war and dwelling on the horrors of it, trying to make that central to the theme of the book that the war was bad. Instead, you get almost something that kind of glorifies World War I uh, in a way and the soldier experience. And last but not least, I want to talk about some of the poems by. Uh, Wilfred Owen, who was considered one of the greatest World War I poets uh, of all time. Now, poetry is a very important part of the World War I um, experience, and a lot of soldiers wrote poetry while they were on the front. Um, well, back at home in England, for the most part, a lot of these poems that were written by people who never experienced war were really patriotic in tone. They were for getting people to be inspired to do their duty in the war, whether that be signing up as a soldier or serving in the factories as a, as a civilian worker, whatever that may be. A lot of these poems that are coming out from, from Britain, uh, that are written for audience at home by people who stayed at home, uh, did not really talk about the war as seen by soldiers on the front. So for a lot of soldiers who read it, they were really like, oh, this isn't what war is like. This is a caricature of what we're actually experiencing. However, Wilfred Owens uh, took a different tack when he wrote about uh, poetry uh, at the front. And it wasn't all just patriotic BS. In fact, he tried to write about his experience and he wrote some of the most powerful poetry about the war. I'm actually gonna read you one of those selections now. And it is called uh, Duce Ec Decorum S. I hope I said that right. Bent double like old beggars under sacks, knock kneed, coughing like hags we cursed through sludge. Till on the hunting flares we turned our backs, and towards our distant rest began to trudge. Men marched to sleep, many had lost their boots, but limped on bloodshot. All went lame, all blind, drunk with fatigue, deaf 
even to the hoots of gas shells dropping softly behind. Gas, gas, quick boys, an ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. But someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime. Dim through the misty panes and thick green light, as under the green sea I saw him drowning. In all my dreams before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. If in some smothering dreams you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face like a devil sick of sin, if you could hear if at every jolt the blood come gargling from their froth corrupted lungs, bitter as the cud of vile and curable sores on innocent tongues, my friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory the old lie, Duce el decorum es. Pro Patria Mori. Here in this poem, we see what Owen is, is trying to convey to his audience. He's trying to convey to him that if you saw how horrible war really was, you wouldn't be telling your young men to come to this war and how great it would be to come here. And here you see this man that he describes has been basically a casualty of a gas attack and how horrible um, it was to see him basically in pain and suffering from this gas attack. To see real and true suffering. If you were to see that real and true suffering, the poems that you would write back at home wouldn't be all patriotic and trying to get more men to join. Another good poem by Owen that I really liked uh, was uh, The Soldier's Dream. I dream kind Jesus fouled the big gun gears and caused a permanent stoppage in all bolts and buckled with a smile monsters and coats and rusted every bayonet with his tears. And there were no more bombs of ours or theirs not even an old flintlock, nor even a pike. But God was vexed and gave all power to Michael, and when I woke, he seemed to our repairs. And you see here, probably the dreams of most soldiers, that they will wake up and the war will be over, that uh, the horror of artillery barrages, of seeing men go across no man's land and never seeing them come back, will soon be over. But however, he wakes up to the harsh reality that the war is still going on, that he has to continue to fight and sludge through another battle, another day, in order to see his duty through. And the sad fact about all this is that Wilfred Owen himself did not survive the war. He actually died on November 4th, 1918, a mere seven days before the end of the war. And so as we've seen, uh, World War I had a huge effect on these men who served in the war and inspired these great works of literature that tell us about the war. Some of their accounts focused on the, the horrors of the war and why it was such a bad thing, and others focused on the more gripping and exciting parts of it. But in either, either way you look at it, the war affected these men and what they will write down for future generations of people to read. So in this video, I only looked at three works of literature that are written by people who experienced uh, the war. And so uh, down in the description box below, I will post uh, other suggestions of books that you can read if you want to do some reading about World War One. not only by people who experienced it personally, by people uh, who experienced it maybe secondhand, like as ambulance drivers, or Bailey was just writing about it um, as a work of fiction. So um, I will post, link, I will post um, suggestions in the uh, description box below for that. Also, I want to bring your attention to a series of videos by the booktuber Bookish. Uh, he has done, a, I think, four videos about American uh, World War I literature, and he highlights some work. So I will post links to his videos uh, down in the description box uh, below as well. If you like this video, please uh, hit the like button. If you want to see more videos from me, please subscribe. You can follow me on Twitter at GhostReads28 and also on GoodReads. The link to that is down in the description box below. So as always... Keep reading.